Hey, Vibrant. It's good to see you. Good to be together today, isn't it? Uh, it really is a great day for a great day. I was supposed to preach last Sunday, uh, but Saturday morning I woke up and I had like a 103 degree fever and uh, went and got checked out. I had strep throat and an ear infection. Uh, what am I in third grade? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I remember I was this, I can't remember the last time I was this sick. So, uh, Alex uh, texted Alex Robinson um, and uh, said, hey, man, uh, what's it look like for, for you to, to preach this Sunday? And uh, he just stepped in and rocked it last Sunday, didn't he? So we're really blessed. Have a great team. And so I, I didn't really get back on my feet this week till like Thursday. So, I mean, this week was a wash. But uh, I am uh, antibiotic up and caffeinated and uh, ready to go today. Does that sound good? So... Hey, I got a report uh, just recently from our executive pastor, Jamie, and uh, she let me know that Father's Day this year, I don't know if you were here on Father's Day, but we had more people uh, at church that Sunday than we did on football Sunday in February. Y'all, come on. Like, if you have no context for yet, it's like, oh, what's the big deal? Like, football Sunday is our number three most attended Sunday outside of Christmas and then Easter. Hello. So for Father's Day in June, the summer, to be to top football Sunday, come on, y'all. Like, God is blessing our church. He's blessing our ministry. And so um, to that end, here's what I want to share with you, that if you know someone that could use some hope or the love of Jesus and uh, they're not connected or engaged at a church Give an invite, like an, a simple invite could literally transform their reality or their eternity. And so don't shy away from extending an invite, all right? Hey, we're in a series called Google God, and uh, it's been a fun series. I'm not sure we got the monitor on here, gang, if we could take a peek at that. Um, we're going to get that fixed. But we're in a series called Google God, and uh, today's message is called What is the Bible? What is the Bible? Um, and so what we did is we actually looked at the top Googled questions as it relates to faith, as it relates to God, as it relates to uh, Jesus, and we just took those top questions and said, let's answer them with you. So today's question is, what is the Bible? Now, uh, when I ask you this question, what is the Bible, I would be curious to hear your thoughts on what this is. Um, I I've got a variety of different thoughts. I grew up in a uh, traditional church. I don't know if you grew up in church, but I grew up in a traditional church. And we used to do these things called sword drills. I don't know if you heard of these. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you're, I don't know why you're clapping for sword drills. Uh, I'm just kidding. No, no, no. Uh, but sword drills, when, when, I, when they were described, we're still doing them. Still doing them, Ruth. God bless you. Uh, <laughs> I love you, Ruth. Uh, Sword drills, when I heard about sword drills, when I first heard, I'm like, all right, let's bring out the swords. I'm ready to I'm ready to duel or whatever sword drill sounds like. That sounds way cool. And then they brought out the Bibles. I was like, ha! Ah! And then <laughs> if you don't understand what it is, you put like the, the, your sword of the Spirit, the Bible, uh, on your head, and then they give you a scripture, and the first one to go to that scripture wins. And I'll have you know, it was the 1994 Riverton Christian Church sword drill champion here in the flesh. Come on, somebody. You didn't know you were in the presence of royalty today, all right? <laughs> but this Bible, friends, it's, it's funny. Like, there's, no, there's not another book that has sold more copies than this. There's no, more songs that has been sung based on this, art that has been based on this, more conversations or um, even talks around this inspired text. Like, this book has inspired billions over the ages. This book has been translated into thousands of different languages and is considered to be the greatest modern masterpiece that we have today that's literally in the palm of our hands. So what, what is your view of Scripture? And this book continues to inspire many. I, I thought what was interesting was I, I wanted to look at what other people thought about Scripture and so I found a research, uh, some research that was done by a group called Barna, and they did kind of the state of the Bible as it assumes, uh, as it relates to 
uh, how, F, uh, how Americans engage with it. So we still don't have the monitor working, but we're going to throw it up on the screen here. So check out this first chart with me uh, as Americans engage with Scripture. Do we have that? We're going to throw that up? Maybe we won't. Maybe we will. I can see it in the back. We just got to shift it over. There it is. Hey, the Bible contains everything a person needs to live a meaningful life. Now, I would assume that people would say no, but here's what the reality shows based on 2021 study is that 30% agree strongly that it does. Uh, We're back. 24% say agree somewhat, and only about 25% say they disagree. So the viewpoint among the culture of Americans with the Bible or Scripture is Tremendously positive, actually. Uh, Here's another uh, graph that I'd love to share. Do you think our country would be worse off, better off, or about the same without the Bible? Now, if you were to tell me, like, I would assume the majority of Americans would say we would be better off without scriptures. That's just not the case. Like, 54% 54 of Americans said we would be worse off without the scriptures. Uh, Third said about the same, and then 15% or so said we'd be better off. Here's the last table that I'd love to show. Uh, How often do you use the Bible on your own? I was really curious about this. On the far left, you'll see increased engagement. So you'll see about 11% said they do about daily, 5% are four to six times a week, 9% a few times a week, 9% is about once a week or once a month. So we have over half of Americans, friends, are engaging with Scripture on a regular basis. So there is this unique uh, perspective culturally that this book is still giving some type of value to us today. Now, here's how I'm having trouble kind of understanding that's these statistics, is the scriptures, while the scriptures may be viewed positively in our culture today, um, I'm getting reports that uh, church attendance across America is uh, actually on the decline post-COVID. So, and praise God, we're not in that boat at, at Vibrant. We're seeing it on the, on the uptick. But friends, it, it's, it's curious to see how Americans are engaging their faith today. This still seems to be something that is valued. Uh, we can see this, uh, this text really valued in this new TV show. I don't know if you've seen it. It's called The Chosen. You guys watched this or seen this? It's phenomenal. It's really, really good. Uh, my wife and I are just started in season one, and uh, no spoilers, okay? Uh, season one, and it's, it just essentially tells the life of Jesus. Well, have you heard of this uh, TV, uh, TV uh, studio called The CW? The CW, I'm, I'm assuming you have. It's a major uh, channel television studio. Uh, CW's president of entertainment recently announced that they're going to start showing The Chosen on their TV station. And here, here's what the president actually said in a statement. He said, The Chosen is based on the biggest IP of all time, and it's truly a one-of-a-kind series that tells this historically significant story in a captivating, dramatic, and premium way. Now, I thought it was fascinating. I don't really have a thought one way or the other. Like, that the president would note that this is like an IP, like the, 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 the biggest IPs of all time. If you don't know what IP means, it means intellectual property. So when I think about intellectual property, I think about Star Wars, Okay. Uh, Spider-Man. Who's able to show a Spider-Man movie now? Is it Fox? Is it Sony? Is it Marvel? Who's able to do it, right? Who's got the IP? So for the president to, or the president of the CW to suggest that this is, would be intellectual property, that somehow someone has the capacity to tell these stories or not, it's just kind of fascinating to me. But there seems to be a renowned respect and admiration for this text. Now, here's what I do think about um, the culture's viewpoint of the scriptures, is that I do think culturally, we are at a hope deficit right now, like a courage deficit, a hope deficit. And so we are desperate for some hope. We're desperate for some encouragement. And I'm a follower of Jesus, and I wake up every day desperate for some hope and desperate for encouragement. And praise God, I find it in the sustaining power and the real person of Jesus. But listen, friends, while people are inspired by this book, there are many that are confused by this book. Anybody ever been confused about the Bible? Come on, let's have real talk. Anybody real talk? I I remember when I was encouraged to read this book. um, And so how do you start by reading a book? You go to page one, right? So you go to the start. And uh, and I didn't know really much about reading scripture. And so I started with page one, which is Genesis 1. And I'm like, ah, that's a cool place to start. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I'm like, all right, I'm jiving with this. Like, this is a good story. Then it gets to a flood, and then it gets to this life of Joseph, and then it gets to the Exodus, and I'm like, okay, 
Like, I'm still, still following this, not sure when Jesus comes in, but uh, I'm assuming it'll happen at some point. And then I got to Leviticus. <clears throat> if you've ever tried to read Leviticus, it's not exactly an exhilarating read, all right? It's a lot of law about what you can and can't eat, what type of cotton you can and can't wear, tattoos, uh, where you need to be traveling, uh, how marriages work, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I thought that was odd. And then my, I, I bared through it, and then my young high school brain got to the Song of Solomon. <laughs> <laughs> With a teenage boy going through puberty, <laughs> testosterone raging, Song of Solomon probably wasn't the best read for me. Hello? Because uh, <laughs> it is a little edgy, right? And I'm like, where is the inspiration out of this? Like, where, when do we get to Jesus? And it took me about two-thirds of the way before we actually got to this book of Matthew where I found the person of Jesus, right? And I, rem- I remember when uh, my, a friend of mine came to faith and he was told to read the scriptures and to start with Matthew. And so he read the book of Matthew and he, uh, he finished Matthew, and then he read Mark, which is the life of Jesus. Then he read the book of Luke, and he, which is the life of Jesus. Then he read the book of John, and he came back to this guy who introduced him to Jesus, and he goes, why are there four different Jesuses in the Bible? Like, I don't understand why we had to read four different stories of this different Jesus. Like, no, it's all the same Jesus. But anyways, it can be confusing, like, for those that don't have a whole lot of context. And so, Uh, How am I supposed to engage with this? Uh, 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 So we're going back to this question that was asked, what is the Bible? Uh, Is it someone's intellectual property? Uh, How should I engage with it? How do we engage with it? And how does this ancient document transform and change our lives today? And so if you've got a a notebook or a Bible open, we're going to be engaging in those. I I want to just make this Bible one-on-one, okay? And I've only got a few minutes to spend with y'all today. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a broad look at Scripture, the macro view, and then we'll get into a micro view of what Scripture is and what it means for you and for me. And then I'm going to get real practical and just give you some handles on if you've struggled with engaging in Scripture or finding a next step, um, or maybe your Bible reading has been stale lately, I want to give you some next steps that could bring it back to life. So Bible 101, uh, here we go. Are y'all still with me? Come on, are y'all still with me? Now here's, here's uh, let me just, I thought I'd just start with a, the broad view. Why do I love the Bible? Because um, I've devoted my life to the communication of this thing. Like my life is staked on this. My eternity is staked on the truth found in this. So why would I love the Bible? Well, let me give you a broad view. This is why I love the Bible. The Bible is a book that's actually a compilation of 66 different books. We've got 37 that make up the Old Testament, and then the rest make up the New Testament. It's written with potentially 40 different authors. Isn't that incredible? Uh, We've got uh, kings. We've got uh, uneducated fishermen. We've got a shepherd. We've got an ex-Pharisee. We've got a doctor. Hello. Um, And it's written over the span of 1,500 years. Isn't that incredible to consider that the scriptures were written over 1,500 years? We got that slide? There it is. Over 1,500 years. It's written uh, in three different languages, uh, predominantly in Hebrew and Greek and also in Aramaic. It's written with three different writing styles. For any of my writing uh, or English fans in the room, there are different writing styles in this thing. About 45% of it is written in a narrative form. A third of it is written in a poetic or poetry form. And then about 20, 25% are written as this uh, prose discourse or just straight message or law or sermon or letters or even an essay. And then this ancient document is written 66 books, 40 authors, 1,500 years, three different languages, three different styles, but it has one main theme. And what is it? God created it, we broke it, and now He is restoring it. And so if you're, if you're, if you're tentative about engaging with this book because you feel like it's going to command you or require you to be perfect, let me be clear. Perfection is only found in this book at the beginning of Genesis, at the end of Revelation, and in the person and work of Jesus. Everywhere else in Scripture is a ton of mess, okay? It's about messy people living messy lives, but finding that there's a God who loves them anyways, is pursuing them anyways, and is calling them to a higher purpose anyways. Like, that's good news, isn't it? Like, there's stories of 
uh, people who are uh, killing other people, hello, uh, adultery, we've got uh, people in prison, we've got people shipwrecked. I mean, it runs the gamut in this thing. And what we learn in this text is, regardless what this means for you and for me, is regardless of the pains of this life, the suffering that we may experience, or the things outside of control that are navigated in this life, we realize that God is present even in the middle of it. Because if God is present in the middle of these pages of scriptures, in this mess that happens throughout this book, it means that he's present with you too, that he's present with you. So why do I love the Bible? Uh, if, if we've got any writers in the room, I know we've got a few in the room, any writers in the room, you know how difficult it is to maintain one present theme over several pages, especially different chapters, okay? The fact that we could have 66 different books written by 40 different authors over 1,500 years in different languages with different writing styles have one central theme is a miracle. I mean, this is a work of art. It's a modern miracle with which God placed in our hands. It's a book of hope that we can find hope and freedom in Jesus. And it's beautifully designed with one purpose. I had a friend who had this poster up in his office. Check this out. It illuminates Scripture. So this is, uh, on the far left side is Genesis 1, and on the far right side is Revelation 22. And then right in the middle, you see this long text. That's Psalm 119, which is written up of some 170-some-odd verses, right? But all of these links are cross-references to the different pages and books of Scripture in which they all beautifully weave together. Isn't this beautiful to see? All beautifully weave together towards one main theme, which is God is pursuing us with his love for his purpose and by his grace. Amen? This book is a miracle. Now, I've had friends ask me uh, here at Vibrant, they're like, Drew, should I bring my Bible or my Bible app to church? Absolutely you should. Like, the reason I encourage us in our, our time together to open your Bible or your Bible app is what I want to do is I want to help you uh, engage in Scripture on your own beyond Sunday. And so if you can engage with it well on Sunday with me, uh, I, I'm confident that you can at least engage with it in some capacity on your own through the week. So let's do it now. Let's put it into practice. If you've got a Bible, Bible app, swipe those open. Let's go to Psalm 119 together. Psalm 119. Now, the Psalms are in the Old Testament. The Psalms are a collection of songs, poems, and prayers to God. Not all of them are pretty, actually. Uh, potentially about 65 of these Psalms are sad, or they're Psalms of lament, or anger, or frustration. It's real life stuff. Now, we don't know who the author of Psalm 119 is technically, but we do know that it was written on the other end of some conflict, and it celebrates the written word of God given to us. It's 176 verses, hello, and we're actually going to go through each one of these verses verse by verse. So if you had lunch plans, go ahead and cancel them. Um, I'm kidding, all right, before you try to sneak out, okay? I'm just going to break it up a few verses together, and uh, we'll illuminate the potential that these scriptures can have for our lives together. Does that sound good? It's going to illuminate some of the potential that these scriptures can have for our lives together. And then in that, I want to give us then some practical handles with how to engage with this. I'm going to be reading from the uh, NLT translation. Um, and so uh, it, your scripture may look a little bit different, but I'll have it on the screen here as well. Psalm 119, let's start in verse 1. Joyful. Everybody say Joyful. How many people want to be joyful? Anybody want to be joyful in the room? Come on. How many people want to have joy in the room? Anybody want to have joy? I hope you would want to have joy. If you don't want to have joy, we can have a conversation because you may be a little wackadoo, all right? I love joy. I love having joy. And so it gives us this instruction on where joy comes from. Uh, the, the text says, joyful are people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Verse 2, joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. They do not compromise with evil, and they walk only in his paths. You have charged us to keep your commandments. What's the word say? Carefully. Skip ahead to verse 44. I will keep on obeying your instructions forever and ever. I will walk in freedom, for I have devoted myself to your commandments. If you're taking notes, write this down. Freedom is found in obedience 
to God's scriptures. See, the the secret to a joy-filled life is actually found in obedience to God's scriptures. And the secret, listen, to living in freedom is to actually live in obedience. Now, uh, some of you uh, individualists and, and strong personalities, you may be pushing back against me right now because um, you, you may say, true freedom, Drew, is uh, being able to do whatever I want to do whenever I want to do it. And the scriptures are really clear. True freedom is not being able to do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it, but it's being able to say no to habits, thought patterns, addictions, temptations that are designed to destroy, listen, friend, who God created you to be. Maybe you've heard this word sin. Sin is a fancy church word of saying, missing the mark that God has set for you and for me. I heard a pastor recently define sin as lowering yourself below your created intent. Isn't that good? That's what sin is. Sin is literally making yourself less than who you were created to be. It binds you up. It holds you down, it chokes you out, it seeks to hold you captive, it calluses your heart, it dulls you from life around you, and it causes you to live in fear. Now you may be pushing back and you go, Drew, it's law that is restrictive, it's law that binds us up, rules are meant to be broken, amen somebody, right? Rules are meant to be broken, telling me that I should, what I should do isn't freedom, it's restrictive. Now if you have that thought, which I have often too. Um, Here's where I'll leave you, because we could spend the whole time just talking about this idea of freedom within restriction. Uh, Let me break it down for you like this. I have a a five-year-old son. His name is Judah, and Judah is the ringleader to our Peterson Circus. Anybody know what I mean? Like, he is our crazy kid. He's going to be our broken arm kid. He's the kid who sees anything that remotely resembles something that could be a jungle gym. He's going to climb to the very top of it and see if he can jump off of it, all right? Like, that's just his style. Now, if I were to open the front door of my house and just say, Judah, go have fun, and just give him the freedom to be able to roam wherever he wants outside of my house, would that be a gift to him or would that be a burden to him? I mean, he may initially see it as a gift, right? Like, he could do whatever. Like, he could go wherever he wants. But we know it's to be a burden. Why? Because my son's five. He doesn't necessarily know where his yard ends and maybe the neighbor's yard begins. He doesn't know that those cars that pass by our house are potentially dangerous if he were to encounter one of those. He doesn't know that there could be an animal lurking around the corner looking to hurt him. He doesn't know that there's actually danger within the freedom that he would be given if I simply opened the front door and said, go play, Judah. But here's what I do give to my son. As I open the back door, my fenced-in backyard, and I say, Judah, go play. Now, it's a fenced-in backyard. Is that a gift to my son or a burden to my son? It's a gift to my son. Why is it a gift? Because there is minimal danger back there. Uh, I, I, I can regulate what comes within the fence and what comes out of the fence. I can uh, give him freedom to know where he can go and where he can't go. Um, I can protect him from what's beyond the fence. And the gift of the fence actually gives him freedom to simply be himself. That he doesn't have to walk in fear. He doesn't have to walk in any shame or uh, potential anxiety about what may be around the corner. Like, he can just run and roam and play and be free. And that gift of freedom, friend, isn't found in the capacity to do whatever he wants whenever he wants, but it's actually found within the fence. And the same is true for you and for me, friends. Boundaries make freedom possible. Obedience unlocks freedom. And when we actually step into that obedient life, which is found in obedience to what God has written, that obedience actually leads to a joyful life for you and for me. The scripture says joyful are those who live with integrity. The reason that there's pain in this world, listen, the reason that there's sin, hurt, shame, suffering is because we hopped the fence that God gave us in the first place. We left the boundary with which God set for us. And so the gift of Scripture is that it allows us to illuminate our feet, to illuminate our heart, and to bring us into true joy, true freedom, which is found in obedience to what God has given for you and for me. See, friends, this Scripture, this Bible, is a roadmap to actually discovering your true created self, which is a person who is deeply loved by God 
who wants to be given life with Jesus. Like, that is what it means to, to step into our true, created, perfect self. Psalm 119, let's go back to it, and let's skip ahead to verse 105. Scripture says, Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. 165, let's skip ahead to 165. Those who love your instructions have great, what's the word? Come on. Those who love your instructions have great, what's the word? Peace. Peace. And do not stumble. Friends, if you're taking notes, write this down. The Bible unlocks your potential. It unlocks your potential in us. And the first step to reaching out and accomplishing our God-given potential is being obedient to what God has already spoken. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with folks who tell me, Drew, if I could just hear from God, like, I would then know what to do. If they're faced with a difficult choice or a difficult circumstance, like, they just want to hear from God. And here's the next question I'll often follow up with in a gentle and kind way. It's I'll say, uh, when was the last time that you engaged in the Scriptures? And they're like, ah, oh, well, that's, like, big and confusing. And, like, I don't know, like, when was the last Sunday? That was the last time I engaged with it, right? Um, Friend, we can't ask for God to speak to us if we won't first listen to what he's already spoken. Like if we're not actively engaging with what he's already shared with us for you and for me, friends, how can we expect God to illuminate or reveal something with which he's already spoken? Like if you want to hear from the Lord or you want to spend time in intimacy and relationship with him, friend, it's, it's, it's going to start right here with Scripture. And here's what happens as we engage with Scripture, is it illuminates the presence of Jesus in our lives. It lights our path. It allows us to see that our our sins, our mistakes, don't have to be the thing that defines us, but we can be identified as children of God. Like, all of that is found here in the Scriptures. It reminds us of our true created intent. And friend, here's the bottom line of of, of our message today, is that the Bible is the roadmap towards your true self. It's the roadmap to your true self. And so if you want to discover your created purpose or your created intent with which God created you, it's going to be found right here in these scriptures, friends. Dive into them, soak in them, and allow them to wash over you. This is the only text that as I've read it, I'm discovering that it reads me. (laughs) It's a little scary, right? Like, I'm, I'm just, I'm learning, like as I engage in this, it reads me and it illuminates how I am to look more like Jesus every day. It gives me encouragement and hope and it inspires and it uplifts. And so here's what I want to do. I'm going to move through these quickly with our time left, um, short few minutes, is what is your next step that you need to take with Scripture, okay? And whatever your next step is, I'm going to give you a practical way to take that next step, okay? Are y'all still with me? Come on, are y'all still with me? Okay, here we go. First off, uh, some of y'all just need to read it, all right? That's like the starting point, okay? It's just read it. Like, that's the, that's the starting point. And you're like, Drew, well, how much do I need to read? Do I need to read a whole book? Do I need to read a whole chapter? I don't care. Like, read a verse. Just one verse. Like, start there. Just start by reading it. Like, engage with it. And if you're unsure of where to start, friends, there's a really great app called the Bible app. Like, shocking, right? And it's full of great Bible reading plans. And even like, if you're like, gosh, I just need something because I feel anxious. Like, search in the plan anxious, and it's got a whole bunch of plans on anxiety. Or like, if you're just like, man, I want to learn more about Jesus. Like, search Jesus, whole bunch of plans like on, on what to do with that. Like, there's even, shocker, a verse of the day. Like, just do that. Just read it. Like, start there. And if you're not engaging with the Scripture regularly, just engage with it. Read it. Now, some of y'all get caught up with, like, the different translations to use. And some of you may grew up in a, a, in a super fundamentalist church that, that said, if, if you don't read from this specific translation, then you're going to hell. And I'm like, yikes. Like, it's just not true, okay? Like, that's, that's just not true. Like, what's the best translation for you to read from? I, I've listed a few of my favorites But friend, can I just like share something without you throwing tomatoes at me? The best translation for you to read is the one that you're reading, all right? Like, just read it. Like, just read it, all right? And allow it to read you, friends. So maybe that's the way that you need to engage with Scripture is just start by reading it. Uh, Another is when you feel confused by it is to study it. Study it. And friends, you don't need to go to cemetery, I mean, seminary. (laughs) 
<laughs> to be able to fully grasp and understand this thing. Like, there are great uh, thought leaders and uh, professors and theologians, and even our team, like, we would, we would be glad to help you understand context. Um, but there's a really great resource that I use personally a lot, and it's really simple. It's just called The Bible Project. And uh, if you were to Google Bible Project, like, whole website pops up, They've got great videos on each book of the Bible, and it just helps you figure it out and, and make sense of what you're reading, okay? That may be your next step that you need to take with Scripture. Another step you may need to take is to memorize it. And friend, this one's most difficult because we're not disciplined. Let's just be honest. We're not disciplined with this. But if we prioritize being disciplined for this, it, it's going to transform and change your life. There's a scripture that says, I have hidden God's word in my heart that I might not sin against him. And I, I was really blessed to grow up in a traditional church that, that forced me to memorize scripture when I was young. Because here's what I've learned in my adult years. Like, I'll be up in the middle of the night stressing or fretting about something, and I can't sleep. And then all of a sudden, one of those scriptures that I memorized will just all of a sudden hit me in my heart. And I'm like, oh, like I have peace now because of that scripture that was hidden in my heart. So memorize it. And if you don't know where to go with it, there's an app for that. I'm not kidding. This, this app is super great. The Bible Memory app, if you need some help with uh, memorizing scripture, the Bible Memory app, fantastic. All right? You all still with me? Okay, next up, if maybe the next step you need to take is to pray it. Like, I, don't get overwhelmed by all these tools, friends. I told you this is one-on-one, okay? Figure out what is the one tool that you need to use and then put that into practice this week, okay? I'm giving you a whole bunch of tools, but just pick up one of them, okay? Don't feel like you have to pick up all the tools at once and like try to put them all into practice. Like, just pick up one of the tools and put it into practice this week, okay? So if you need to pray the scriptures, there's a really great app for that too. It's called the One Minute Pause app. It's, it's transformed my prayer life, and it, it, it will really help you to allow these scriptures to be intertwined within your prayer life. And the next one is to live it. Like, you just need to live the scriptures. And the best way that I've learned to live the scriptures is it's best in relationships. And the fact that you're at church today is a great step towards that. Small groups, serving on teams, just getting around other Christians helps us to live out and obedience, what God has shared for you and for me. And so we need one another. Our faith was not meant to be developed in isolation or alone. It was meant to be developed with one another. So live it. Friends, this book has transformed my life. And I've staked my life and my eternity on the words that are found in this thing. And, and what I've discovered is it through these pages, Jesus is revealed to you and to me. But here's the truth. I think some of us have become almost numb to the reality of how accessible Scripture is to our lives. Like, you may have inherited a Bible from a grandparent that passed away that just sits and kind of collects dust on the shelf, and it looks kind of cute, but you just can't seem to throw it away. Um, the Bible's kind of funny. Like, we have it on our phones, but we never pull up the app. We tattoo it on our bodies. Um, like, we have it so accessible to us. We, we've got it active, like we've got free Bibles for you today, but um, friends, it's so easily accessible for you and for me. But here's the truth. There are still today over 128 million people that are Bibleless, um, And there are 1,600 languages that have never been translated, the scriptures have never been translated in their language. Isn't that shocking? Now, could you imagine being a people group that spoke your native tongue that you didn't have these scriptures in your language? Like, it kind of puts it into perspective how blessed we are that God would allow these scriptures to be written in our language. That, that's why Vibrant is uh, super blessed to partner with organizations like Pioneer Bible Translators who are actively working today to translate the Bible in every language. But I wanted to close with a video. There was a group of, in, uh, of friends in Indonesia that uh, didn't have the Bible translated into their language. And a few years ago, an organization changed that for them. How blessed are we that God would choose to place his written word in our language so that we wouldn't have to have someone help us to understand the scripture and read it on our behalf, that we can read it for ourselves, that we can know him for ourselves. And the gift of that is that this written word 
reveals the word made flesh, who is Jesus. And it's Jesus, friends, that changes everything. And so would you allow this written word to reveal the word made flesh, who is Jesus, in your life every day, that he's with you in every season, in every storm, in every circumstance, in every difficult place, and he's working to restore and redeem what's been lost or broken or wounded or hurt in your life. And all of that, friends, found right here. So let's engage with it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, Lord, I am so grateful that you would choose to give us access like this to your written word. And Lord, I'm going to ask that uh, in our lifetime that we would see the Bible translated into every language, Lord. May it be so. That we would be able to stand and say, There are no Bibleless people in this world, Lord, so may it be so. And Lord, would you empower Christians and organizations and churches like ours to be able to help make that happen however you lead us. But Lord, in the meantime, as uh, we're trying to just live every day and uh, work, family, life, Lord, I I ask that you would uh, inspire us to find you in your written word that you would encourage us, that you would lead us and guide us, that we wouldn't be overwhelmed by this mountain of text, but that we would feel find freedom and life and hope and joy, that we would be eager to share it with our children and grandchildren, that we would be willing to allow it to read us so that we could look more like you to a world that's desperate for you. So would you allow your light to shine deep within us and that your life be our lives, Lord, maybe so. We love you and trust you and give all these things to you. In Jesus' name, amen.